Welcome to the Chassan and Kala Shmuz that you wish you had but never got, part 30. Be'ezus Hashem, if there is enough time today, I believe this will be our last discussion in the series. I urge you all to listen to these discussions from beginning to end, starting with the one uh, titled Intro, then it goes labeled part 1 all the way through part 30, and you could um, Google my YouTube channel, Simcha Feuermann, and then on the uh, YouTube channel, there's a playlist which consists of the Chas and Shmuzes, and they're in order and linked to each other. In our final discussion today, we're going to we're going to talk about the laws of uh, Nida, and in particular, the ways in which these laws impact upon some people um, in unintended ways. There are people that suffer from trauma and other forms of abandonment where their ability to self-regulate, their ability to maintain a sense of attachment and connection is extremely disrupted. And because of that, the on and off cycle, the being connected and being disconnected, and all the processes in between can feel really, really painful, sometimes for the man, sometimes for the woman, and have many unintended consequences. It's important to know that the laws of the Torah are designed for the maximum benefit for the maximum number of people. And there is obviously divine wisdom in these laws. But at the same time, do not make the mistake of thinking that every single halacha that you observe will always help your life feel good right now. And sometimes sacrifice is necessary, but of course, sacrifice with wisdom. And that's why we're going, we are going to discuss this issue in great depth. Now, the Rambam, in the beginning of his Shemona Prakam in Perak Aleph, speaks about the notion that just as a person who is unwell physically may require interventions and medications that normally are bitter or even harmful, imagine somebody with cancer who has to take chemotherapy, which is toxic, just like somebody who's unwell, the sweet is bitter and the bitter is sweet, and what's harmful is helpful and what's helpful is harmful. He also says somebody who is spiritually and emotionally unwell will have difficulty sometimes experiencing aspects of the Torah and mitzvahs in the ordinary way as being helpful. Even though, Pekudi Hashem Yisharim Mizam Chilev, even though the commandments of Hashem are just and glad in the heart, but that's a general rule. The Rambam in the Mor Nevuchim and the Guide for Perplexed, uh, part 3, chapter 34, is very clear that just like uh, nature itself is designed for the maximum benefit, and nature itself provides many good things for all creatures, there can be an individual situation or circumstance where somebody suffers from nature, tidal waves, storms, diseases. So too, he says, the Torah, which is the will of Hashem as much as nature is, if not more, it is designed to bring a great deal of good, the maximum amount of good. But that doesn't mean that a particular individual in a particular circumstance might not suffer in some way personally from a commandment, and in some way that commandment might not be good for them. Now, the Rambam is not suggesting an abrogation of the law. He is not suggesting that one violates the law. He's simply commenting on a reality, that the nature of law itself that you cannot escape is, it is designed more or less to be followed rigidly for the preservation of order and for the general good. That doesn't always mean at a moment in time that will be good. It could be it will bring good in the long run, even to that person, but it doesn't mean it will be experienced as good. And that's very important to understand here, because when it comes to observing the laws of Nida, it brings a lot of good to couples. It teaches emotion regulation. It teaches that there's times where you must develop your love and develop your focus in a non-physical way and not be distracted by sexuality. It teaches an appreciation for the other person. It allows a couple to reflect on time, the passage of time. Every, every month or so, if a woman has a period, it's a recognition and maybe even 
a, a sense of grief. The great feminist psychoanalyst Karen Horney said that there are no biological causes for PMS, for premenstrual syndrome. It is the emotional, unconscious grieving of the woman for the child she could have had. Now, we can um, argue about um, such a blanket, arrogant statement. However, I think there is some truth to it. While we're on the topic of PMS, it's also important to understand that probably one of the most emotionally suicidal things to ever say to one's uh, spouse, to one's wife, when they're upset at that time of the month is, oh, it's because it's that time of the month. And there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, when somebody's subjectively upset, they really don't want to be invalidated. And second of all, I don't really believe that's true. I believe that there's a, an experience that's going on that women in particular who are much more emotionally intuitive when they're pregnant, when they're menstruating, they have different experiences and each of those experiences represent a particular kind of wisdom. So yes, at different times, a woman might focus and magnify certain emotional concerns, but they're not distorted, they're magnified. When a scientist looks under a microscope to find out if there's a pathogen or not, the scientist is not distorting anything by magnifying it. The scientist is using magnification as a tool to understand something in depth. And I believe that many times women experience dramatically different states of subjective experience because they are magnifying and noticing something that's important. So a woman who's pregnant may focus on the relationship more and become much more concerned with security and welfare because she's nesting. Um, and during uh, the time of menstruation, there may be other types of foci, other types of, of, of needs that are brought out and they are not to be ignored or to be littled. They're in fact to be welcomed because there are opportunities to learn more about each other and about the relationship. And I think an important introduction to this discussion about Nida and abandonment and trauma is that the word itself, Nida, is a complex word. And we're going to try to analyze that word etymologically. But culturally, I noticed that many women use the word not clean. Um, they say, I'm not clean now. And I believe that it's a very poor and damaging translation because Tuma and Tara, actual Tuma and Tara, while there's no question that there's an association and relationship to cleanliness and uncleanliness, um, and you just need to, to read the different parts of the Torah to see that, the word Tuma and Tara does not refer to physical cleanliness or uncleanliness, and it's not really a great argument that it always refers to spiritual uncleanliness. So, for example, in Emor, when it's talking about, um, uh, 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 you know, sexual immorality, it uses the word unclean, uh, tame. So, obviously, over there, it is referring to some type of corruption or disruption of a spiritual state. But uh, with other types of tuma, it's not clear at all. Um, it's probably closer to uh, an understanding of death and loss and chaos without the organizing force of God's presence. Um, life is lost, and Tuma, most of the time, is in some way recognized with the number seven, which is the days of creation, which is the days of mourning, the days of Shavabrachas. There's something about, about death and life that intersect with the number seven. You don't have to be a great mystic to notice this. And Tuma itself, impurity, has to do with, with oftentimes loss of life and recognition of the loss of the godly force because God is life, etc., etc. And that, you know, in that way, probably the Karen Horney, who I quoted earlier, she may have been onto something in terms of the fact that a woman who is menstruating lost the potential for life. And a couple needs to reflect whether they're going to have more children or not have children. They need to reflect even on the passage of time. Uh, the fact that another month has passed without that reminder, without that hard break, maybe just one month leads into the other and there's no focus. So a couple needs to really think about what these things mean and, and, 
and not to just let time go by. And what greater time, what greater way to do that is when you can't have your desires gratified. So you need to focus on less distracting things. Now, the word clean and unclean is offensive, and it shouldn't be used. Even though the Gemara and Shabbos discusses on Daf Samach Dalaram and Bey 64b, the Gemara and Shabbos discusses actually the meaning of the word nida, and the Chachamim, the Chachamim um, actually learn from the word nida. Nida can mean to be distanced and to be pushed away. That the Gemara over there says the Chachamim, and it's important to pay attention to this from beginning to end. The Chachamim say, the sages say that. Therefore, a woman, when she's a nida, should not adorn herself or wear colorful clothing or makeup because she is being distanced. She is um, nida. But along comes Rabbi Akiva, and this is fascinating. Along comes Rabbi Akiva, and he says the following. If you do so, you are making her unappealing to her husband, and her husband will consequently want to divorce her. Therefore, extreme strictures should not be instituted. Rather, what is the meaning of the verse that states, and of her that is sick in her menstrual status? She shall remain prohibited in her menstrual status even after the flow of blood until she immerses in the waters of a ritual bath. Now, what's going on over here is Rabbi Akiva is, is reinterpreting the words vinidasa tehe, which the rabbis learned as remain distancing to say she'll remain a nida until she goes to the mikvah. What most of you may not realize is that, um, in fact, in fact, um, because you're not used to learning Pshuta Shalmikra and then learning uh, Medrash Halacha and understanding the nuances and the difference between the two of them, there is no Pasuk Beferish that actually says a woman who's a Nida has to go to the Mikvah. There is no such Pasuk. The Pasuk says she is a Nida for seven days. And actually, this Gemara and this Rabbi Akiva is one of the sole sources for the limud that a woman, even after her menstruation is finished, remains tame, vinidasa tehe, remains tame, remains nida until she goes to the mikvah. Take a look at Tosus Yevamas Daf Memzayan Ahmed Bey's 47b, Dibber Amaskal Bemakom. This, so Rabbi Akiva, he basically reinterprets the Pasuk and says it's not saying, it, the Torah is not teaching you that women should be distanced. Quite the contrary, if you distance her, you'll lead to all kinds of shalom bias issues. And instead, he relearns the Pasuk to teach you a very important limud that a woman, even if she finishes menstruating, she does not automatically become tahora, but she must go to the mikvah first. And what is even more dramatic and surprising, and believe you me, if the Ben Yehoyada did not say this, it would sound like some kind of um, reform rabbi said this. The Ben Yoyotis says that Rabbi Akiva of all people was the one who made this drasha. Rabbi Akiva made this drasha because he honored his wife, Rachel, with special jewelry, the Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, when she lived in poverty, when she lived in poverty while he was studying abroad for those uh, 14 years. Now, is that not or is it 24 years, doesn't matter that much. The point is that isn't that remarkable? So Rabbi Akiva deliberately reinterpreted the Pasuk, Ben Yodasa Tehe. Ben Yoyada says he did it because he was sensitive to women, and particularly his wife, that she shouldn't feel unattractive and not beautiful. So I think that that's a uh, remarkable um, introduction to the whole topic. What can we do? What's going on over here? What if between a couple, between a husband and wife, they experience the sudden disconnection, and for that matter, the sudden connection again, as traumatic, as hurtful, as being objectified? So the first thing is, like we said before, this is a barometer for your overall health, your overall health as an individual and as a couple. So if this is so disruptive, aside from just feeling a little bit uh, painful, it is sad to lose connection with somebody, and sometimes it's hard suddenly to reconnect. That's all normal. But if it's extreme or intense, we have to ask ourselves, what in the world is going on? And there could be individual issues around trauma and abandonment and body shame, um, and there could be also uh, couple issues. So one thing you have to think about is, 
how do you manage, what are your rituals? How do you manage disconnection? How do you manage reconnection? And those kinds of conversations are really good to have in advance before the crisis hits. Firemen practice fire drills and practice emergencies. Football players practice their, their maneuvers before the actual incident, because when you're in the incident, you cannot think. You're in panic. So husband and wife need to sit down and talk about how do they handle when you become a nida? How do they handle when you do not become, when you become tahora again? What would help the transitions? What makes people feel comfortable? What during the nida period will work? Sometimes it might be good to have almost, uh, in case of fire, break glass plan. What happens if someone is feeling so desperate, so deprived, that they just want a hug? Um, what happens if by accident somebody forgets about the harchakos in public? How should that be handled? These are all questions that need to be figured out and figured out in advance. Maybe a special gift, maybe an I love you poem, maybe a card, maybe chocolates. There, is there something that would that would help restore a certain sense of emotional um, equilibrium. This is extremely valuable to plan in advance. Yeah, one of the big questions that comes up is, what if a person really is so emotionally desperate and hurting so much, could they ask for a chaste, non-erotic hug from their spouse during the Nida period? And this is a very, very difficult sukkah. Um, the, the sources to look at would be in Shulchan Aruch Yeradeya, uh, in Kuf Tzadei He, Sif uh, Yud, uh, Sif Tesvav and Yud Zayin, the Shach, the Nosekelem. It's very complicated for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in depth, but I can tell you it's complicated for reason number one is because if even physical touching is considered a Doraisa, which it might be, you have the problem of, you have the problem of violating a Doraisa. So now you have to go past mild emotional distress or moderate emotional distress, which might allow a rabbinic violation, and you have to say the emotional distress is so great that a person's life is in danger. Somebody's going suicidal, or they're so angry they become dysregulated and can do, and can do dangerous things. Even with that, you have another problem because you have the famous Gemara and Sanhedrin, Ayin uh, Heimad Beis or Ayin Chesimad Beis, it's the famous Gemara which discusses uh, a person who was lovesick, and the point of that whole Gemara is that when it comes to things that are related to sexual immorality, the rabbis were reluctant to allow a violation even if somebody's life is in danger. So now you have a problem. If this is considered Doraisa and it's related to sexual immorality, you might not even be allowed to do that. That is a big problem. Um, there are possible ways to resolve it, but it is an enormous halacha challenge, aside from the fact that there's a slippery slope, which is that if couples start engaging in some type of emotional slash erotic connection during um, nida, will it lead to much worse? And that is a very big problem, and rabbis must grapple with that as well. All I can tell you is, I will not go into this in depth, not in a video. The, I do have in the PDF that is available for sale if you uh, email me, uh, you can find out more information, but there's a PDF summary of many of the issues in the Chassan Shmuz, and on this PDF, I have an in-depth discussion of all the halachic uh, features and um, interesting tshuvas regarding this issue. However, um, you know, again, this is educational. I'm not giving therapy over a video, and I'm not paskening halacha for people over a video, but it's important to know that these resources exist. Some people prefer to avoid becoming needle altogether, and there are tactics for that too. There are forms of birth control like IUD, uh, especially the hormonal IUD, or certain pills that reduce the number of periods far less. And, you know, frankly, that's an option in situations like this where people are really um, being emotionally traumatized. Now, when it comes to even the process of bedikos, of the internal examinations that women uh, do in order to make sure that their uh, their time of nida has stopped and that they um, a achieve seven consecutive clean days. By the way, that's probably where 
the word I'm clean and unclean comes from, from the Zayin Nikim, from the seven clean days. But that actually has nothing to do with nida or impurity. That simply is the rabbi's way of saying that a woman needs to count seven days to verify that she is not anymore a zava. I can't really explain zava right now, but the point is that it means clean without blood. It has nothing to do with cleanliness and it has nothing to do with impurity. But in any case, um, some women find that invasive. Some women find um, going to the mikvah where they have to unclothe in front of another person because the halacha is uh, nearly unanimous with some exceptions that you need a witness to see her fully submerged uh, so to make sure that the hairs don't float on top of the water. And for some women who have body shame, uh, a, a woman could be overweight or a woman could have body shame for other reasons, and they can have trauma. Going to the mikvah itself can be an extremely difficult experience. By the way, there are some poskim, again, this is not a, um, a halachic tshuva over here. I'm not telling you halachically what to do. There are poskim that might, I stress might, depending on the degree of, of trauma and distress, that might allow a, woman, allow a woman to wear a very uh, loose-fitting hairnet and be terrible without, um, without a witness because we don't have to worry about the hair. Um, and again, this is not a heter. I cannot give you a heter, and I cannot tell you which rabbanim or how strongly that heter can be employed. There are also some poskim, again, with the same introduction, that might allow a woman to wear a loose-fitting robe. And by wearing a loose-fitting robe, uh, they can feel covered still and not feel naked in front of the person who would need to observe them being tarvo. Again, the trauma associated with bodies, associated with being examined, associated with being unclothed, can be extreme for people who have experienced um, sexual abuse. And for that matter, there are people who have experienced what we can call spiritual abuse, which means in their life, rabbinic or other authority figures like parents ended up bullying them, hurting them, being insensitive. And if you have both combined, if you have you have a matter where somebody was sexually abused by a person who was a rabbinic authority or a parent who's an authority, one can just imagine how complex it is to submit a personal part of their life to uh, a rabbi to be reviewed, even a most wonderful and well-meaning rabbi. And for some women, this can be extremely difficult. Now, there are uh, yoatzot and and women who sometimes act as go-betweens for these matters. Um, all these things are, are interesting, and I'm not here to tell you exactly what the solution is. I'm here to say how complicated and how sensitive one must be. One cannot underestimate the power of trauma. Trauma is extremely subjective. So one person could have been sexually abused for years and show little or no um, difficulty afterwards. That's just how some people are. And others could have experienced very mild kinds of sexual abuse, just an inappropriate touching, or even some kind of psychological seductive head game with an authority where their sexual abuse is strong. You cannot measure it. It is subjective. And it's important to realize how subjective these things are and how much we must care. The ultimate, you know, the ultimate measure, as we said, of the health of a marriage is how you function together in all kinds of circumstances. And many people end up fighting a lot during the Nida period because they don't have the regulation. They don't have the self-regulation, the self-confidence, or the love and connection. And that needs to be accomplished with possibly um, therapy, planning ahead, uh, flexible uh, halachic psakim, if they can be allowed for certain things, any which way to to be sensitive and care. So I just hope that this, these discussions that we've been having together, which comprise Chazdei Hashem, probably more now than, than eight hours of discussion, I hope that it fills some need that um, will help um, other people, other people live the, the Torah life the way it's meant to be lived, a life of attachment to Hashem, a life of shalom bias, and Tom v'nishlam shevach l'keol bari olam, 
we have completed hopefully something that is a praise to the Almighty, the Creator of the world. Yilaroson Imre Fi, let the words of my mouth be uh, accepted. Vehegyo and Libi, and the thoughts of my heart, Lefanecho, let them be accepted. Everybody, Hatzlacha in your life and growth together in your marriage.